Jay at the time was living in a house on Easton Drive in Benedict Canyon, just about a mile from the Cielo Drive house. The last time Jay's neighbor saw him alive, he was driving his black Porsche out the driveway and down this narrow road to Benedict Canyon. This information comes directly from E.J. Fleming's book, Paul Byrne, The Life and Famous Death of the MGM Director and Husband of Harlow. Paul Byrne, who worked for MGM, built this house in 1930. He lived here with his wife, Jean Harlow, and this is also where Paul Byrne died on September 5, 1932, under very mysterious circumstances. Officially, it's a suicide. A lot of people think it's murder. Through a terrific, uh, fortunate series of events, I happened to uh, had the opportunity to meet the, the nice people that uh, purchased Jay's house, Jay Sebring's house on Easton Drive. And it's the nice Ron and Maggie Hale. And Ron uh, very kindly invited us up to see the house today. Thank you very much, Ron, for, uh, for joining us today. Nice to have you here. <laughs> now, how, how did you come about uh, acquiring this, this beautiful home behind us? Oh. Gee, that's a long and complicated story. I'll try to keep it brief. But going back to my college days at UCLA, there were a group of us that used to go driving on Sunday afternoon, take a break from studies and explore anything, any odd byway in the city, and encountered this house someplace along that line in the late 1950s, and I thought it was a beautiful place, and it always stuck in the back of my mind. I used to come by here, had a once every six months, I'd drive by on a sunny afternoon. Just because it caught your eye, because it was yeah, such a magnificent place. I just thought house. it was a beautiful place. Okay. And I always thought, gee, I'd, I'd love to own that someday. So, so you, you managed to get in touch with the, um, the Sebring, or the, they, it was on the market. And yeah, it was legitimately on the market. But the Sebring's, Jay's parents were very upset with the whole concept that their son had been murdered by a drug-using, uh, would-be rock-and-roll star hippie, and they wanted to make damn sure that whoever bought the house was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And mostly they were getting offers from like rock bands that wanted to buy this as a retreat in the hills. Um, the Doors were occupying a house just a few, few, uh, oh, door, really? few doors up the street. They were on Easton, eh? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they were renting a place from Stuart Whitman. Uh, so here I was, a young, presentable doctor with a a uh, pretty blonde wife and they liked me and so they agreed that they would let it go for substantially less money than they were asking. The house was built during Prohibition and it does indeed have the bookcase that swings out from the wall with the bar behind it. So the, the most famous story, uh, a paranormal story about this house, or one of them anyway, was Sharon Tate was, uh, when she was engaged to Jay Sebring for about the year, she spent many nights here alone. Uh, she supposedly saw the ghost of Paul Byrne scuttling around the bedroom. She went downstairs, down the staircase, and at the bottom of the stairs was an apparition of a woman with her throat cut, tied to the banister. Some people think that may have been a premonition of her own. Uh, demise, which is quite uh, just as dramatic, probably just a few years later. Have you or or Maggie had seen any sort of uh, paranormal experiences here? Never. Ron and Maggie Hale have owned the estate since 1970. The rubble of Sebring's life lay throughout. Papers and photographs of Christmas gatherings and pool parties intended by the likes of Steve McQueen lay scattered about and unclaimed in drawers. Sebring had painted walls purple, the master bedroom black, ceilings mint green, and the beautiful interior woodwork white. The plaster between the beams was covered with brightly colored wallpaper. In the 1970s, the estate became a beacon for hippies and Manson aficionados. One morning, walking to get his paper, Ron came upon a couple having sex in his car in his driveway. Above the entrance to the changing room at the end of four large beams protruding from the house are four visages gazing down like gargoyles. MGM writer Sam Marks remembered the faces Paul had studio craftsman carve, represented the four winds, and other people identified them as everyone from Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford to John Barrymore, Valentino. Paul told intimates they were faces of four people who had been closest to him in life, naming three, Barbara Lamar, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Carrie Wilson, but never identifying the fourth, a beautiful young woman. The faces are remarkably similar to photos of Dorothy Millette. Jay Sebring was the stylist to the stars, and he, he was responsible for George Pappard, Steve McQueen, Frank Sinatra, and Jim Morrison's famous trademark flowing locks look. 
Jay Sebring, owner of Sebring International, was the first men's hairstylist to make it big. He was the face of men's hairstylists. And he died, and Vidal Sassoon became the guy. But one of Jay Sebring's two salons is right across the street at 725 North Fairfax. You see where the striped awnings over there now. The building on the left with the six square windows is the original building where Sebring's salon was located. Jay also cut hair for uh, William Dozier and Adam West. Adam West, of course, Batman, and Dozier produced the show. Dozier had mentioned that uh, they were doing a spin-off of Batman and they were looking for someone that could do karate. While Sharon Tate and Jay were together, Sharon was working on a movie called The Wrecking Crew and the two of them together took lessons, karate lessons from Bruce Lee. So William Dozier asks Jay and Jay says, wow, you should meet my karate teacher. He used to do movies back in Hong Kong. His name's Bruce Lee. That's how Bruce Lee got his part as Kato because of Jay Sebring.